Okay, record on audio. Okay, logo's on screen. Okay, standby theme music. Go on theme. It's Tuesday, September 3rd, 2013, and you're listening to Sin Boldly, the podcast of the Sign Your Name Project. I'm Trey Comstock. With me this week is Stephen Doss. Hello. And Kathleen Royston. Hello. This week, we are exhausted, and therefore, we're talking about clergy depression, abortion, and an in-depth discussion of Christian responses to the violence currently raging in Syria. However, we start tonight with clergy self-care, or lack thereof, in the news. It has definitely been one of those weeks for us. But apparently, it's not just us! According to a study out of Duke Divinity School's Clergy clergy Care Initiative, pastors experience about twice the rates of depression as the average average U.S. population. Based on 1,700 interviews of United Methodist pastors, um, they found that United Methodist pastors have about a depression rate of between 8 and 11 percent, depending if the survey was done online or over the phone. Um, That compares to 5.5 percent in the general population. The study attributes this to things like the difficulty of living up to a divine call, the various expectations placed on clergy both by themselves and by their congregations, and the almost complete absence of work-life balance at times. So, based that we all work in various ministry jobs and plan to continue in that, do y'all connect with this in your own context? Well, I mean, we only work two hours a day every Sunday, so why do, why do we need to be depressed? <coughs> yeah, what what's... Yeah, hmm. Wait, wait a tick. I, I haven't worked two hours on a Sunday in my ministerial job. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... I think it's the idea that... What is that noise? <laughs> oh, that's probably an ad. <laughs> it is, but where is it coming from? It's coming from the production. Oh, it's Fancy Feast. And Kitties! that and that is the reason we're all depressed. <laughs> we don't okay. have enough cats. <laughs> we're back on the rails. We Sorry have about that. too many cats. No, it's just I only have two. It's just the fact that um I think there's a huge disconnect between <laughs> what people in the ministry actually do and what the idea that people in ministry do because I don't know about you but when I was just a church member I wasn't at the church during office hours or during you know another programming maybe like a Wednesday night program or a Thursday or a Monday I was there Sunday from well, I didn't go to Sunday school. I was there Sundays from 11 to noon. And then I went promptly to the Golden Corral, because that's what you do. Um, and it's just, there's an idea that, you know, the congregants may have, I know I had, is that church, people who work in church are only there part-time. It's not a full-time thing. They're volunteers. They want to do this. Um and therefore they don't have anything blocking them from dealing with my stuff. So it's easy for congregants, and I'm guilty of this too, saying, you've got plenty of time. All you have to do is write a sermon. And then I went to seminary, and I worked in a church, and turns out that's not all they do. So I think that's one part of it. But even just that, even if it is just write a sermon, that's... <laughs> hours, people. That, hours I mean, and hours and hours. You know, a rule of thumb that a uh, a mentor of mine taught me, and it's not actually a rule I keep to, but it gives you a gauge, is that for every minute of finished sermon is like an hour of prep. Mm-hmm. So if you assume the average yeah, method of sermon is 15 to 20 minutes, um, 30 for really pushing it, um, that's between 15 and 30 hours of work. 
So that's like a, you know, half to two thirds of a normal work week just into this one thing. Now for me, my sermon prep's more like, well, I'm having to do it really quickly because I'm not just a pastor, but you know, my sermon prep is still six to eight hours of work on a given week for a 15 to 20 minute sermon. Um, and that's part time. So if you're assuming I'm part time, I should be working 20 hours a week. That's roughly half to 25% of my week is spent just on the sermon. Um, but I also think some of it is just depression runs high in a lot of caring professions. Mm-hmm. And, and some of it goes beyond just the workload and the work life balance. It's you're taking on other mm-hmm. people's stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and you're standing in the midst of that and you feel a very high expectation to take on other people's stuff. And I'm not actually speaking out against that. But what I'm saying is there needs to be a intentional regime of self care that goes with that in order to truly be effective. Um, I have a professor at Candler, Dr. Ellison, who takes pride that he's recommended over 50 students, soon to be clergy, um, to therapy. And it, you know, it doesn't get talked a lot about, but I think that most pastors should be in therapy. Most people should most be in therapy. Most people should be in therapy, sure. But certainly most pastors, just to be able to deal and process with the stuff you take on mm-hmm. and the stuff that gets thrown at you, right? So a lot of times, and I'm in the honeymoon period with my current church, and so it's all, you know, essentially goodness and light. But a lot of things get hurled at you. Right? I've been called an enemy of the gospel. Um, you get called terrible things. Your work gets picked <clears throat> apart. And, and that also adds to the weight you're carrying and why I think all pastors should be in therapy. I think also, and this is something I don't know that I realized. I worked as a, I mean, I'm still technically a layperson, but I'm seeking ordination. Um, and I worked as a full-time layperson in the church for two years before I went to seminary. And... What I notice doing seminary and working, and I think is this way vocationally for pastors, there is no part of your being that does not get used in this work. So it's it it's, can be physically exhausting. Anyone who's ever worked vacation Bible school can attest to that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's physically exhausting. Um, so you're using you're using your body. You're using your mind. Um, you know, in writing a sermon, you're interpreting difficult texts and thinking about church history. I mean, so there's a lot of intellectual stuff that goes on. And you use, obviously, your spirit. It can be emotionally draining when you're dealing with people in times of crisis. So there's nothing... I feel like there is no part of my being that does not get used and not infrequently uh, wrung out in this kind of work. Um, And so I think that that's that might be a source of some of this. When you feel like your entire being is in service, um, and since those needs never go away, pastoral needs do not go away because it's 5 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 3 a.m. on Christmas. Um, that need is still there. So there's this, this sort of constant, this large amount of energy that it requires, but then also it never stops. Um, and I think that that's probably a source of it. It is. I mean, it, it's kind of, and and that's actually what you just mentioned. The idea of it never stopping is something that was brought up in the Duke study. That it's just, it is this kind of mm-hmm. all-encompassing thing. And one thing they pointed out that I thought was really interesting is most jobs, when you finish at the end of the day, if it, the day didn't go well, okay, fine, whatever. You know, the the researcher says, I'm a researcher, and so when I go home and my research didn't go well, I go, oh well, you know, that's just a, a day I'll do better tomorrow. But because clergy feel a divine calling to this and feel that you are kind of mediating a divine human relationship to put a huge theological spin on it, but you are trying to connect people with God. And so the responsibility gets amped up. So if you feel like you said the wrong thing, have you poisoned their relationship with God? Have what you said misrepresented God? And, and so it becomes this kind of feedback loop that it's hard to have a bad day. And when you have a bad day, it leads to much more fundamental questioning than, you know, when I was a teacher, I was like, ah, I blew that. Pfft. We'll get it back tomorrow. But it's harder, the Duke study points out that it's harder for clergy to do that because of kind of the degree that your theology gets wrapped up in how well you can do your job. 
Um, and I, I thought I thought that was interesting in particular that it kind of reinforces how bad things can feel. That's that's interesting. I get that. I do. But I almost wonder if that's a misunderstanding on the part of clergy of the role of the pastor. Hmm. Um, if we think that the words out of our mouth are divine words, not not that that's what that's saying, but this idea that like if we say something wrong, we really screw people up. Like, yes, we do have to. I think I think pastors do have to be really careful. But I almost wonder if we think about ourselves not as mediating the divine presence but inviting people to experience it um if that and i haven't done i haven't i'm not clergy so i haven't done this but i wonder if maybe that's a little bit of what's going on with this level of anxiety about that um that if some of it is a is our misunderstanding of and and on the part of congregations too like i think that that's very much there Mm -hmm. that congregations perhaps have expectations of the role of the pastor um and i think particularly in american consumer churches that the pastor is somehow the one who dispenses the divine presence instead of inviting people to experience what's already there but i mean even if it is inviting rather than dispensing there is still a level of responsibility there Mm -hmm. that is hard hard to ignore and hard to step away from right that okay if you didn't do it right you didn't issue the right invitation. There's still, mm. I mean, there, there's still risk and there's still mm-hmm. a sense you can really mess people up. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know how much I connect with that. I just thought it was interesting that the Duke study pointed it out. Um, but something else that, that's interesting in being pointed out is this week's Tales from Conservapedia. Stephen, what do you have for us this week? Hello again and welcome to the Tales from Conservapedia lounge. Pull up a chair. Pour yourself a drink. It's going to be one of those. Are you going to be like walking into like a shadow profile? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do a good. My my uh my Alfred Hitchcock is about as good as Trey's Joel Osteen. Okay, so. terrible. Now go. <laughs> anyway, so today, as I was perusing Conservapedia for hilariousness, I came upon hmm? I came across a story about a um, a progressive group. I'm not going to name the progressive group because the conservapedians, conservapiddles, whatever they're called. Conservapi- <laughs> conservophiles. Conservophiles. <laughs> what would make liberal? Anyway, um, commenting, uh, and this, this person, this head of this progressive group had said a prayer thanking God for abortion doctors Hmm. and abortion legislation and that abortion legislation in Iowa failed and said it in prayer form. And that got this, I believe the website was called, I'm not, uh, it's conservative, just go to conservapedia and that, that'll make you giggle. But this website did not make me giggle. Um, So my question to you is, what's your gut reaction to that, that someone was thanking God for abortion clinics and abortion doctors and abortion legislation and the fact that this failed. And number two, yeah, thoughts about praying for stuff like that. Because you're both either pastors or going to be pastors at some point. Sure. And to kind of lay my cards on the table, I'm not just pastor. I uh, am pursuing a master's in public health. Um, with a specialization in sexual and reproductive health. So I kind of come at this issue from two different directions, um, both as a pastor and (coughs) as a, you know, sexual health practitioner person. Um, I, my, my gut reaction is to agree with the prayer. Thank God for abortion doctors. And specifically because they function to save women's lives. The kind of a lot of the studies and uh, on the statistics of abortion and, and actually how it functions is laws against abortion don't actually stop abortions. What they do is they lead to unsafe abortions. In countries where it's illegal, 
abortions are still happening in large numbers. They're happening in back alleys. They're happening in, you know, barbaric ways that are putting women at huge risk. And, it, you know, it's, it's a leading killer of women worldwide. It's an epidemic. And yet, it doesn't stop just because you make them illegal. In fact, that just makes it more dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so what an abortion doctor does is when the procedure is done in a medically qualified place, it's there's very little risk to it. Mm -hmm. It's not negligible, but it's one of the lesser risky um, invasive surgeries. Um, there, you know, the, we have very good kind of results out of it. The procedure is very safe. It's it's relatively fast. It has a very fast recovery time, especially for younger women, which is most of the people who are getting abortions. And so, thank God for abortion doctors for saving women's lives, because regardless of the stance you take on the status of a fetus. Is it a life? Is it not? And that's really what the abortion debate comes down to, is where do you draw that line at life? Um, <clears throat> to me, I do draw it at some point in the pre-birth time frame, but where in the pre-birth time frame is a really difficult place to draw. <coughs> and there is, a good, there is good biblical evidence to say it begins at conception. Like, that is a faithful reading of the biblical witness. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to negate that. But what I'm saying is, is anti-abortion laws do not stop abortions. They merely push them underground and make them unsafe. And there have been horrific stories, even from this country, of women dying unnecessarily. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. My gut reaction is to agree with that prayer. Thank God that they're willing to stand in this controversial issue, mm -hmm. do something that is generally, at least in every state, a touchy subject, um, and save people's lives. Mm -hmm. I think for me to to talk about any discussion of abortion and being pro choice or not pro choice has to also address larger issues. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. just about fetuses. So abortion is such it is such a complicated yeah. issue. Um and it comes down to access to birth control and mm -hmm. good sex education mm -hmm. and poverty and all kinds of different things, health care. So all of these huge issues, and I think what's missing from this this debate on both sides is a discussion of those larger issues as well. Because it's, it's I almost want to say that the level to which it has been politicized has not reflected the complicated understanding of of what's going on um and i i'm with trey i think that my my gut reaction is absolutely and for many of the same reasons mm -hmm. um but i think that if we're going to have a faith-based discourse around this in a responsible kind of way we need to think about life being the whole of human life well i, I think you raise an interesting point right very few people actually want there to right. have to be abortions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, no matter what side of the debate you're on, <coughs> they're not they're right. not a positive outcome. Oh. They are negating something. So what it boils down to is if abortion anti abortion laws don't actually stop abortions, they just make them unsafe. What does stop abortions is four very simple things. One, provide care for unwed mothers. Now the Catholics are really good at that. They have unwed mothers' homes, and, and they mm -hmm. care for them, and, and, and you know, <coughs> they do all they can. Fund adoptions. Mm -hmm. That's okay. two. That's two. Fund adoptions. Catholics also do that. Through, I've, I have a good friend of mine that went through an adoption process through Catholic Charities, and they, they really make that process livable. Three, and this is the more controversial one I understand, three is fund contraception. Yep. Yeah. Prevent the pregnancies from happening in the first place. Except, as many even mainline Protestant churches do, that occasionally un sex is going to happen between unmarried individuals. It, it's just, it's a reality of the human condition that has existed in time immemorial. And while we can preach against that, and probably should, um, you can't completely eliminate it, and so you need a harm reduction strategy. <laughs> and a harm reduction strategy is easy, cheap, or free access to contraception. And the fourth thing, 
And if your church can't be out front on contraception for doctrinal reasons, the fourth thing we all can be out in front on, and that is ending the stigma of teen pregnancy. Mm -hmm. If it ceases being a stigmatizing, socially ruining thing to be pregnant, as in without being married or being young and pregnant, then there's going to be less of a social pressure to lead to abortions. So those are four things. Those, at least three of those are things that every church in this country mm -hmm. should be able to get behind. And I would argue at least most mainline Protestant churches should be able to get behind the idea of free, easy access to contraception. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have, many of us do not have doctrinal things arguing against it. Some of us even have doctrinal things arguing for it. If you want to stop abortion, which pretty much everyone does, no matter what yes, side no of the no matter issue, what side you are on. No matter what side you're on, those are the four things to actually do it. Not push abortions underground into unsafe and potentially deadly circumstances. But it's much easier to just say, we're not going to have any abortions, and then they don't. the numbers show that there were zero abortions performed in the state because no one has to report them, but you also get mothers passing away that... Right, and so they just... Yeah. You know, in country, in the U.S., they can at least go to other states, which is hugely inconvenient, but it's still possible. Yeah. But in countries where it's illegal, they just, the doctors know, and there are just mm -hmm. coded things that, they, you know, mm -hmm. just uncontrollable hemorrhaging without any other explanation. Well, that just means death due to an unsafe abortion. Mm -hmm. But it just gets classified in some other way because they can't write that down. Yeah. This is a this is an issue I've I've spent a lot of time with. I think this issue may be important to you, Trey. <laughs> well, what well, is? I uh, I took a class at Rollins <coughs> School of Public Health called the Gemma Seminar, um, which is a, a Gemma is an organization that tries to stop maternal death due to abortion, um, due to unsafe abortions. And so I sat in that class, and I was one of the few representatives from a faith community in mm -hmm. that class. But even still, you walk away. The the key thesis of the class is what I've been laying out here. Mm -hmm. and if you actually want to stop abortions, okay, fine. But let's do this in a way that actually stops abortions and not do this in a way that just kills women. Because that's what's happening with unsafe abortions. It's just putting women up, exposing women to unnecessary risk of mortality. Now down to a more practical um, aspect. How do you, as a member of a faith community, um, drive the conversation towards the four things that you mentioned. How do you get churches to actually be on board when it's so much easier to say, we don't like abortions, abortion shouldn't happen, and then be done with that conversation? I, you know, some of it is present the facts. Um, and if they, you know, I, I thought this through. This hasn't happened to me yet, but I thought this through. Like, what happens if a member of my congregation says, you know, we really want to, you know, put together this pro-life initiative? And I'll say, okay, if we want to be pro-life, let's be pro-life. But let's be pro-life in a way that's actually going to stop abortions. And I think when you explain when you explain people those in kind of a factual way, and, you know, if I was ever going to do this for real, I'd probably get together the studies and actually be able to cite the specific authors, which I'm not mm -hmm. able to do here at the top of my head, um, which maybe I should. I'm sorry, Roger. Um, Roger is my professor. Okay. Um, <laughs> so but you, you just have that honest conversation of if you want to stop abortion, here's how we do it and let's be strategic and let's do this faithfully in a way that honors people as whole people mm -hmm. another kind of i did some research on this and another thing you can do is talk about the idea that our theology always allows for the possibility of sin if you view abortion getting abortion as a, as a terrible sin right fine okay but you should not create a legal framework that does not allow for that opportunity to sin. Because we're not in, we're not in the business of forced conversions. And we're not in the business of forced adherence. Mm -hmm. Now, don't take that logic too far, because if you take that logic too far, it simply means that the church should never be involved in politics. And that's not what I'm saying here, even remotely. But you talk about this idea of allowing people that opportunity to be sinful and then offering them forgiveness and support in spite of it. Well, and that's the United Methodist social principle stand on it, is that, you know, we think it's a very challenging thing, although we acknowledge that it's complicated, and what we pledge to do is be available for support. 
Um, I do also think, like, and, and my, my thoughts on this, like I said before, I think another way to open conversation about, and not just this particular issue, but any of these really difficult issues, is to talk about a vision of life that is total life. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that look like? What is, what is, it, what is our holistic, total understanding of human life? Um, and, and that gets into some other really complicated issues very quickly, but I think that that's the discourse that we need to be having in churches is not just necessarily single issues, not that this is not a very, very important one, and I completely agree with you, but if we believe that human life is sacred, what are the implications of that across the board? Right, and so this this is things like healthcare, healthcare, or the death penalty, <laughs> right, or any number of issues that if you're gonna if you're gonna choose life here, you have to choose life everywhere. You else. have to choose life everywhere else, and that actually transitions us neatly into our larger discussion for today about Christian responses to the violence in Syria. <laughs> So, as most of y'all know, um, the uh, situation in Syria has been escalating over the past couple of weeks. Um, there are accusations of chemical weapon use against uh, the Syrian rebels uh, by the Syrian government. Um, and it's clear from the discourse in Washington that the United States is considering a military intervention in Sir into Syria. And we... Uh, we wanted to take this time and discuss what is it to be a Christian and, and, and how do we as Christians approach this issue of, of war and of v military intervention into other countries and to the use, and, and really what it boils down to is the use of violence to, to try and prevent further <coughs> violence. Because that's really what mm -hmm. the U.S. is talking about now. An intervention to stop the killing of innocent civilians, um, particularly through the use of weapons of mass destruction. So, what are y'all y'all's thoughts on this? I mean, this is kind of a an area where there's been much discussion um, in Christianity over yeah. the millennia. It's it's a difficult question because on one side you're like we have to do everything we can to prevent this type of thing from happening. Um, whether it's on the larger scale, like it is in Syria, or at a smaller scale, where it's violence from person to person. That being said, we're also taught by, um, I believe his name was Jesus, <laughs> that violence... Jesus. Jesus. That violence begets violence, mm. and that when something like this happens, you turn the other cheek. Now, like I said, I went to seminary like you learned folks and there I studied in ethics uh, a man by the name of Reinhold Niebuhr Niebuhr what what can we please give Trey a wedgie <laughs> <laughs> I've been in love with Reinhold Niebuhr since I was a freshman in college <laughs> oh hey um <laughs> anyway he came up with um he was around during World War II and he came up with um a doctrine called Christian realism. And what that means is that sometimes Christians have to commit a sin in order to prevent a larger sin. And at the time it was World War II, so the sin was going to fight, kill another human being, which is, you know, frowned upon by God. <coughs> but that little sin in the grand scheme of things, that little sin that people decided to go prevented a bigger sin, which was, you know, Germany. Well, and I think that's essentially the same stance that Dietrich yeah. Bonhoeffer took at that same time, obviously somewhat in conversation with Reinhold Niebuhr. Mm -hmm. um, yay union, I guess. Um, but, so, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer justified lying and yeah. li living a duplicitous life under a very similar idea mm -hmm. that, you know, the biggest sin out there was Nazism. 
Yeah. Um, and 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 cer- certainly the in particular the Nazi Nazis treatment of the Jews and homosexuals and uh, people with disabilities, but but also just their treatment of all of Western Europe. Yeah. To be quiet, <laughs> Eastern Europe and, and most of the world. Uh, to be North Africa. Qu- North Africa <laughs> and pretty much everywhere. But at the same time. There are other approaches to this, mm-hmm. and you particularly look at the work of Martin Luther King, um, where it very that very much could have been violence met with violence, mm-hmm. and instead he did you know stand in the way, but in a way that was a strong statement of nonviolence. I don't know if it's that I've been off the radar. My original career intent was not politics necessarily, but international relations. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was in college when the Iraq war started and was involved in protesting that and all kinds of, you know, stuff. And I don't feel like I've heard, and this could be that this is not where my attention is anymore, I haven't heard very much about diplomacy in a very long time. I haven't heard... And I don't know if that's just not me me not paying attention. Well, well I think I, we've come to a point where diplomacy is now useless. Yeah, it's di- a yeah. Um, diplomacy's kind of failed. Um, just like in and, general, and not just general... yeah, not just in what? Syria, but in general. Yeah. Um, because you know, every country now has this. In order to protect our best interests, yeah. we can just do whatever the heck we Believe. want. Um, he said, "Heck, I'm very proud." Well, but also, I mean, specifically in the situation in Syria, right. mm-hmm. um, the um, the regime trying to maintain power is basically said, we're going to try to maintain power at all costs. No matter what, yeah. yeah. And so by they, any means necessary. By any means so. necessary. And especially now with the rumors of chemical weapons, mm-hmm. um, diplomacy has essentially gone out the window. Mm-hmm. Now, could there have been a diplomatic solution months ago? I, I To be honest, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, They'll argue, of course, in hindsight. No, of course it was impossible. This we is should, the only way we could. There should have been a military it. intervention months ago before this got wildly out of hand. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can I could write you. You know, I studied domestic policy, um, and and political revolution. So while you know you're the studying, talking points. <laughs> while you're studying international policy, and so I can write you the briefing if you yeah. want. Yeah, it's just it just feels like, and I don't want to sound like the grumpy old lady that I am inside, but that everything has become such a zero sum game. Mm-hmm. Um. And and that is in our own political discourse as well. It, it's realism. It it yeah. yeah that everything it's either it's all or nothing, um, and I think that puts, particularly as Christians thinking about issues like this, that makes it really 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 complicated, mm-hmm. um, because I think that many of us do not believe that things are necessarily all or nothing. Right and thinking about that in a using theological language um that's really really challenging um and then there's the the part of me that is the super realist who's like well this is what we do we live in this world and things like this have to happen and and there are times when military intervention has been necessary um and there have been times when we have not intervened with disastrous consequences, Rwanda, there have been times. Ninety-four, right? To be yeah. a specific absolutely. Instance that's getting cited at the moment. We did not intervene in Rwanda, and millions died. Right. Um. um and, but we did intervene in the Balkans, and fewer people died. Right. P- potentially. Um. And 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 then there's the side of me that thinks that all human life is sacred. Mm. Yeah. And that means all human life, not. Not, I mean, as as hard as it is to say, mm-hmm. not just the innocents. Yeah, but but how do you... And how, what do you do with yeah, that? Yeah, what do you do with that when there's other people in the world, people in positions of power who say, well, that's not the case. The only human life that matters are either people similar to me or people who aren't, who don't disagree with me. All that good stuff. Or people who don't want to kill me. Or people who don't, well, yeah. I mean, Take this out to, you know... To the nth degree. We, we, we talk about, you know, our allies versus our enemies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so we, we, as a country, threw an elaborate party for the death of a man. Mm-hmm. When Osama bin Laden was taken out by SEAL Team 6, mm-hmm. there was an elaborate, ce- impromptu celebration with the chanting of USA, USA, a chant originally appropriated for the Olympics, which is all about world peace, but I digress. So, like, we have this idea in our culture mm-hmm. of the enemy. 
Mm-hmm. And so yep. the em- enemy moves you to a less than human status. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we are in the process of a political discourse that labels the Syrian government as the enemy mm-hmm. and the Syrian rebels as our allies. Mm-hmm. And, and, and sure, like, the Syrian government's doing some pretty messed up stuff. <coughs> like, I'm not sitting here defending the Syrian government, but I'm pointing out that, like, they're not actually less than human. Yeah. That there actually isn't... We, we have this theology that we love and we cling to, that actually nothing separates you from the love of God. And so we cling to that in our darkest moments, right? Every time I screw up, and I screw up plenty. Mm-hmm. I'm not a mass murdering person, but I, I make mistakes and I sin. And those sins are real. And so I cling to that memory, the memory of the theology that nothing can separate me from the love of God. So if these are God's beloved children, Mm -hmm. as are our allies, where do you go from that? Which Mm -hmm. basically seems to be the theme of this discussion is where do you go? (laughs) Yeah. I think this is one of, I mean, this is going to sound like some sort of cop out, but this... Where do you go isn't. (laughs) Well, no, but... Maybe there's some sort of impasse. Maybe that's where we find ourselves, is between understanding reality and holding all of these things in tension, that we are in some ways on this, because we live in this world, a little bit stuck. Um, And that's how I feel about it. I mean, I can... I feel like I have to sort of hold these things together and it's difficult and it's challenging and I don't know what to do. I don't have an answer to this and maybe there's not one. Well, let me, let me rephrase the conversation a little bit then. Are there non-violent ways of stopping the bloodshed? And, and, And that's to me what it comes down to. Have we truly exhausted all of the options? And what comes to mind for me, is the peace and reconciliation teams that operate in Israel and Palestine. And I have very briefly worked with them. Um, But the idea is they simply stand in the way of conflict. They, you know, stand in front of bulldozers, or they stand between Mm -hmm. warring factions, and put their physical presence between violent sides in an effort Mm -hmm. to peacefully end the violence. So rather than violence begetting more violence, they still put themselves in harm way, harm's way, but in a way that is a powerful, non-violent statement. And could something like that, you know, you send U.S. troops, sure, as actual peacekeepers that simply mm-hmm. stand in the way of conflict or stand in the way of civilian casualties. Violence is profoundly dehumanizing, Mm -hmm. Um, particularly in our highly technological warfare kind of world. Um, Push-button warfare. That, right, that you can, right, you can just sit here, no, not right here, but, you know, you can sit. We hacked the system. (laughs) Pew! Um, And never see the people who are being harmed. And I think, I mean, quite frankly, this is this is something with chemical warfare, too. There's this level of impersonality about violence. Um, and I think that what you're suggesting is very interesting because it, it, I, it puts bodies, like actual real bodies, in the face of violence, um, and that can that can be powerful. But I also, I don't know. But I mean, to me, that also takes more guts than going out there well armed. Yeah. I mean, that takes that takes a radical bravery and an acceptance that you could lose your life and not be able to fight back. And it's a commitment to not physically fight back, but let your presence be a greater statement. And I, you know, I'm not actually saying this is, I'm not actually proposing this as a foreign policy alternative. There's a reason why I am not in politics. <laughs> and one of the reasons is because I don't want to have to make the, I don't, yeah. I, I, I don't yeah. want to make these choices because there, to me, there isn't necessarily, there isn't necessarily a godly way out of this based on two key assumptions that seem to must be maintained that us maintains it's, you know, premier nation status, 
which is not a godly concept, by the way. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And This is not a nation ordained by God. In fact, there's right. no There's nation. no such thing. There's the, no such thing. The, the, the whole idea of God is it stands in opposition Except to nationalism. Belgium. I no, think Belgium is a... No, the <laughs> Belgians are deeply... I, I, I lived in Belgium. I talked a lot about this. Um, but, but I think, given the framework that is created, there isn't a godly way out of this. Because the options yeah. that are being proposed... Mm-hmm. It's an impossible game. It, it, yeah. Or an impossible game, because mm-hmm. the U.S. needs to maintain its position as a superpower. Well, that, that, God has got nothing to do with that. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so, hey, one other thing I wanted to throw into this discussion um, is the doctrine of just war. Ooh. That we have this concept that floats around in theological discussion mm-hmm. and is floating around in the national discussion at the moment that there is an idea of just mm-hmm. war and that there are certain requirements that must be met. And if they're met, then it's a just war. Thank you, Thomas Aquinas. So what are y'all's thoughts on this situation uh, mm-hmm. along the lines of this idea of just war? Thomas Aquinas. Are we fighting France? No. Then it's not a just war. That was Augustine. That was a. Is it? Just where Augustine? I think it's Aquinas, but I've been wrong huh. before. Okay, well, we have the internet. I mean, I don't like Augustine. Okay, so. fine. Augustine, are we fighting the Moors? <laughs> I mean, can we really say now. any war yeah. is just because it's Both still dehumanizing? It's still their high five. We were both right. <laughs> It, this is why we are members of the body of Christ together, because together we, we get her done. We, we lean on each other. Anyway, back to <laughs> sorry, I'm the sorry, discussion just war. at hand. Um, is any war, can any war ever be just? Because number one, it's dehumanizing. You are no longer Stephen and Trey, you're United States and Belgium. Um, I mean, yeah. But let's go, let's you go. lose your sense of self because you become <laughs> basically the... Let's go... Let's Fist go. of a nation. I what? have some pushback really quickly. Ooh. Sorry. Old Testament. Yeah. Ah. Okay. This is the argument. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're fine. Um, this is the argument that I've heard. So we have to take over the country. <laughs> okay. And, and, and kill all of them. And kill everybody. kill everybody. I mean, but, like, this is, right, like, if we're, I mean, this is something, another thing, it's not just theological history and Aquinas and mm-hmm. Augustine we have to deal with as people of faith talking through these issues. It's our own sacred text. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and so I'm throwing that out there. You can go back to what you're going to say. I got really excited and had to no, no. talk about the Bible. Thank you. I mean, um, that's a that's a great point. Is like war is all. I mean, heck, the Book of Joshua. Yep, and the judges, and, the judges, and kings, tent pegs. Yeah, tent pegs. Oh, I love that story. And you know which one Song I also of Sol- love? Oh wait, that's not about that. That's, that. that's, <laughs> that's a, a previous kind of story. Oh, so the other one I love is the. Uh, when the Israelites are taking the ark out in front of them and, like, the ark is doing all the killing. Now, there's another interesting point, right? So the mm-hmm. ark is... I've seen a documentary on that called <laughs> Indiana Jones. called Indiana Jones <laughs> and... Yes. The last, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Ark, yeah. um, But the, the ark being carried in front and that it's not even the human armies doing it. It's the unmediated presence of god that's doing the killing of people so other people can have land i mean these are like these are this is why people don't like the old testament um and you love the old testament i do the old testament is great when you look at it in context if you say that applies to right but i mean but this is something to deal with okay but let's go back to what we opened this discussion with you have dietrich bonhoeffer reinhold niebuhr in world war ii Mm-hmm. Let's take. I mean, I think we've moved beyond the Syria aspect. That the, the yeah. Syria, there, there isn't a godly way out of this. But let's look specifically at World War Two. How do you stop Hitler without a military intervention? Well, France and England thought it was by giving him everything he wanted, and that worked real <laughs> that well. That did not work well. So, I mean, but what do you Nobody do in that kind of situation? And, and and theologians that you know we have a lot of respect for reach the conclusion that you take up arms mm-hmm. now. Does that mean that there is, does that, is that a tacit support of this idea of a just war if it is bringing down something like a Nazism? Yeah. And, 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 and so then what, what, and then so what gradation after that is it no longer a just war, right? If mm-hmm. we would have intervened in Rwanda, would that have been a just war? Mm-hmm. Was it a just war when we intervened in the Balkans? Would it be a just war now if we were intervening for the right reasons? Where where do you draw that line? Right. Or or do you? This is somewhat of a straw man, right? You don't. There yeah, is no you, clear line. It's a gray area. It's and, a 
big old gray area. Yeah, there's a great um, um, um to go at the basest, and this is just the basis. I'm talking basis, basis, basis with Rwanda, with um, with World War Two. You had ethnic cleansing. You had a nation fighting against its civilian population. With Syria, you have a civil war. You have a nation fighting against some people who want to a different a different of version nation. of the nation. Um, basically, you have you know two factions who chose violence over. So same thing with the U.S. Civil War. You had, and again, basis, basis, basis. Sure, this sure. is yeah, just yeah. me throwing an idea <laughs> yeah, out I there. Follow you. Um, you have a nation fighting against its own people. The own its own people took up arms, so it's that whole violence begotting violence. With things like you know India, mm -hmm. you had nonviolence that caused a revolution. Sure. With the civil rights movement, you had nonviolence that caused a revolution. Nowadays, you have, you know, you've had the women's right movement. You've had, now you have gay rights. I was going to perform violence from the women's rights movement. Done. Ow, violence happened. Um, I think we have to make a distinction um, if we want to talk about just war. Mm. We have to make a distinction that it's power trying to negate powerlessness mm. pa a, a position of power trying to get rid of the people who aren't in that position of power um, in this situation I, I'm i going to tell you that with the serious situation I don't know who's on what side Sure. but all I know is that it's an armed force against an armed force um, it's not an armed force against its civilian population exactly um, and I think that has to be thrown in when we talk about the just war. Now, with this chemical weapons attack, um, it was civilians, right? Uh, civilians were killed in the attack. Civilians were killed in the attack. Um, I don't know how to deal with that because in in war, there's such a thing as collateral damage. Yeah. Horrible, horrible, horrible term for human life. Lost. But accidentally. It's used. But it is the term that's used. And that's where I feel a little icky about all this is because now you have a group in power who use something that caused civilians to to die. And maybe that's where it starts to turn towards the just war where mil military intervention so, happens. So you reframe, I think in the course of the discussion, what we've reframed just war. Mm hmm into protecting civilian populations. Protecting but protecting the innocent instead of saying, you know, like World War One was all about nations in power fighting nations in power. Mm -hmm. um, they were looking forward to the <coughs> war but they it, before it started. Exactly. Um, we really needed a good war. Well, I mean, that's how you get economies back up. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, huh. What about... In and I know, I know that quote. Okay, I'm not really quoting, but the, the Civil War was not about slavery. I said it when you think when you talk about it historically, the way that it is often talked about is slavery it was, was about a spark, but it yeah. right, absolutely, and not that slavery was not deeply important, but it was about it was about two different states rights and states that kind of rights. stuff. Blah blah blah. Um, so, versus industrial what do you do rights? in an issue like that, where the Civil War did have two, it was two mm -hmm. armed forces vying for power? Right. Is that, if there is other human life involved, does that make it a just war? I have no earthly idea. <laughs> I, if the war was actually being fought for the liberation of the slaves... Yeah, I would say that is definitely a just war. Maybe, maybe if, if there can be such thing as a just war, yeah, maybe if there can be. But right. Abraham Lincoln said that it was not about slavery; it was about preserving the union. Yeah, and, it, and it, fundamentally, it was. It was about power. Yeah, it was about who got to dictate the national agenda. Part right. of that national agenda was slavery. Right. Yeah, but it was who got to dictate that. Like right. the Emancipation Proclamation didn't 
have anything to do with slaves in the United States at the time. Right. It so, had everything to do with the Confederate yeah. States, and then you move on with the amendments to the Constitution. That, later on, yeah. Later on, that kind of sealed the deal. With yeah. The, I believe it was the 13th Amendment. Yeah. Um, but up until the 13th Amendment, nothing really changed. Now, slavery was already on the decline in the North, so it was kind of a really trivial, right. not yeah. trivial, but it, yeah. it wasn't as big of a deal. There could actually be free African Americans at the time, blah, 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 that, which didn't really exist as much in the South. Yeah. But it really was about dictating the national agenda mm -hmm. rather than, and, you know, slavery was just part of that national agenda. Right. That big the North, part, but... Big, right. That the Union wanted to yeah. be able to dictate. But, and I really like your definition, but I think on the ground it can get a little bit dicier very... when you have issues. Like, I, th I really, I do, I think that's a really useful framework for understanding what this might look like in a responsible kind of way but i do wonder i also wonder if it's one of those things unfortunately that isn't clear except in hindsight yeah yeah and i think you can you can you can hear that a little bit in how or feel that a little bit in how we think historically about wars mm -hmm. well i think that's, um, i think that's interesting because it puts a bookend on our discussion Rein one of the things that Reinhold Niebuhr pitches in his idea of Christian realism is that there will always be unforeseen consequences of your actions. Mm -hmm. That we live in a fallen world and we are fallen beings. And so no matter how well you think through what you do on the front end, there will always be unforeseen consequences on the back end that are, that are outside of your control and that you, didn't, you couldn't have foreseen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, it, in Reinhold Niebuhr's view, that does not negate the need for action. And that does not negate your call to action, but you must understand and always seek mm -hmm. to mitigate the mm -hmm. unforeseen circumstances, even if you cannot fully eliminate them entirely. Um, but on that note, we should probably end. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Sin Boldly. If you have any feedback or ideas of topics you'd like to see us discuss, um, email us at uh, sinboldly at nfear.org at sinboldly on Twitter or facebook.com slash the sign your name project. Um, we always appreciate any feedback, comments, or ideas for topics. So please send them on send them our way. And go forth into the week to love and serve the Lord and end fear by signing your name. Good night. <laughs>